Uh, welcome to Burning Books. Um, some new faces out there, so I'm going to be passing around this uh, sign-up sheet. We have a, we have an email list. We do events not not unlike this on a regular basis, and films and books on related topics. And if you're uh, trying to keep up with what we got going on, it's one of the best ways to do it. I'm also going to stick some flyers on here for some upcoming events. You can see on the board behind us, We've got a lot of stuff going on. Um, so it's great to see so many people out here. We're just your, we're just your run-of-the-mill radical bookstore, so it really means a lot. It really means a lot for you guys to come out and uh, pack the house tonight, take time out of your day, and that is what I like to see. Um, this is a really special event for us tonight. Uh, we have a lot of great events, but this one's really special. This is something we really wanted to do from before we even opened up the store. Uh, it was kind of a plan in, in, a, in our heads that we would like to make this happen at some point. It's really, we can't thank you all enough, everyone out here in the Buffalo community who's supportive of, uh, of the struggle and who's involved in the struggle and who can give their energy and their resources and their word of mouth to help make these things happen. There's no way we could have brought this in here on our own. It's contributions from people like you, both monetary and um, and in many other ways that make this community what it is. It makes Buffalo able to make an event like this happen. And I just want to really appreciate you guys all again because uh, because you're awesome. And this is a great event. And I really thank you for everything that you're doing to support us. And uh, and we want to do everything we can to support this community here. We're just putting, we're going to keep plugging away no matter what the feds are doing to us here at the bookstore or to anyone in this community. We're just going to keep working, keep building, and keep this struggle moving on. So I uh, just want to say thank you for all that. Briefly, Ward doesn't need much of an introduction, obviously, with this room packed, but I, I just want to say briefly, just because I have the chance, that, um, that I saw Ward speak uh, over a decade ago at a conference in the West Coast when I was living in, in Portland, Oregon. And uh, at that time, there was a lot of radical activity happening in the struggle, and there was a lot of, um, you know, regular organizing and pacifism happening, and there was a lot of clashing going on between that, and he had an essay release called Pacifism is Pathology that was really making a lot of waves and a lot of us in the struggle were really learning a lot from it and, and having heated discussions and, 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 uh, and that's just one example of the contribution that he's made to this, to this struggle and um, when he came into town um, I'll always remember, you know, I was intimidated as uh, maybe I should be, I was probably 19, 20 at the time and uh, and he came into town, and there were other people that organized this massive environmental conference that was very mainstream, but had a few, you know, fringy elements to it at times. And uh, and it felt like he just came right into town, and he said, you know, where are the people that are doing this work? I was running the ELF press office, and there was a group of us that were doing that, and were involved in the, quote, Eugene anarchist scene, that were doing radical organizing, really pushing limits at the time, and it seemed like Ward really went out of his way unlike so many other people from previous generations of the struggle, Ward really went out of his way to find us, to hang out with us, to have lunch with us, to talk with us, mentor us, and to, to have that connection of intergenerational, you know, fighting from generation to generation, recognizing the work that we're doing, we're appreciating the work that he's doing, and, and that's the type of thing we're trying to build here in Buffalo, and, uh, and that's why Ward Churchill to me, and to a lot of us here at Burning Books, is like a really, really important thing to have happen here. And, uh, and so with that, I just want to say, let's give him a warm Buffalo welcome. Warm Thank you. See you. We'll see you. Hello, my relatives. It's an honor to be here on Seneca land. It's an honor also to be invited to speak at Burning Books. I'd like to thank Leslie and Teresa and Nate and everybody else that was involved for making this happen. I bring you greetings. I'm used to seeing from the Colorado chapter of the American Indian Movement, but I moved to Atlanta last August. And since Aaron Two Elk died, I can't find any aim in Atlanta. So I guess I could say I bring you greetings from Atlanta AIM, but that would be the same as saying I bring you greetings from me. But <laughs> I at the moment, as far as I know, I bring you greetings as well from Worthy Las 
otherwise known as Leonard Peltier, who as I speak to you tonight continues to sit in a cage in federal prison, not for anything that anyone, including even his prosecutor, has been willing to say at any point in the last 20 years they know he did or could prove he did, but rather as a symbol of the arbitrary ability of the federal government of the United States to repress the legitimate aspirations, deliberation of indigenous peoples within its claimed boundaries. And let's put the emphasis there on claim. There's a difference between a claim and a reality. In the United States, claiming a certain territorial corpus does not mean it has any legitimate right to that territory, jurisdiction over it, resources within it, or anything else. Now, I'm in a bit of a quandary because I looked at what was on the poster outside, saw several topics, any or all of which I could address, but any or all of which would require the entire time I would expect to be available tonight to really thoroughly address. And essentially the response was, yeah. So, <laughs> I'm thinking in terms of laying out some sorts of modules of issues that I consider to be important that have guided my work that I think are just as relevant now, perhaps more so now, than they were 40 odd years ago when I started to become active, politically conscious, whatever you want to call it. Lay them out in sort of capsule form and then shut down the talking head part of this and we can get into some mud wrestling or whatever it is you want to do. <laughs> QA, no speeches, no brick bats, spit wads are permitted. <laughs> we can go at it that way. All right? Reasonable human beings in a community setting, something like that. But maybe the place to begin, because it's been consistent in my work, my consciousness, and what I've attempted to do since I was 20 years old, younger. And since it's absolutely fundamental to the nature of the social, political, economic construction we have of this thing called the United States, it goes to the issues of colonialism and imperialism and the relationship between the two. And that's become somewhat fashionable, interestingly enough, of late, with not much reference to the so-called vulgar anti-imperialism that denoted my youth, late 60s, early 70s, when there was a strong anti-imperialist consciousness, but we've got a, a new and more improved form, as there's supposedly a new and improved form of imperialism. In fact, that's the title of several books, The New Imperialism. And I keep trying to figure out what it is that's new about it. <laughs> Terminology tends to be a little new. We've got differences in technology. We've got a difference in the polarities of power on the planet to a certain extent. That changes the construction of the thing, but as to a fundamentally different paradigm of imperial reality, I can't find it. Maybe some of you can, but I think maybe perhaps we need to examine that. The first aspect of the new imperialism, as I see it articulated, even Harry Magdoff, who wrote one of the seminal texts that informed my generation, what imperialism was, ended his life not so awful long ago, having revised his thesis under the title of Imperialism Without Colonies. And I've read quite a lot of that, that colonialism is something distinct from imperialism. Theoretically, I suppose that's possible. The only thing else I cannot find is any example of where imperialism has functioned absent a colonial basis. Now the United States supposedly qualifies for that because of its global reach at this point, its imposition of jurisdiction, dominance, not only economically but militarily and politically on increasingly broad swaths of the planet beyond its proclaimed boundaries. But as I said, there's a difference between a claim and a reality, and we need to go to that. 
the territorial corpus of the United States encompasses, well, it depends on who's doing the counting and how. Through most of my career, we said roughly 400 indigenous nations recognized as such. They've managed to expand that to roughly 500, but you're subdividing peoples, nations, that understood themselves to be Oyesi Pole into subparts of themselves in order to increase the number. That's not necessarily a good thing. Recognition may be a good thing. Recognizing the obvious often is a good thing, but recognition in this sense serves as a sort of functioning divide and rule principle. And divided, consequently ruled, is to be in a disadvantageous position to say the least. It's confusion of identity, it's confusion of unity, it's preclusion of unity, as a matter of fact. But let's understand the nature of what's implied in the circumstance by which you've got these nations. Nations in a legal sense, nations in a real politics sense, encompassed within a territorial corpus of another nation. Now, there's a lot of ways I can go at this. We all understand that there is an aboriginal <coughs> population here using the academic vernacular. In other words, there were first peoples, first nations. First in the sense that they were here when those who claim territorial, national, sovereign primacy over them first arrived. And there's not even a clarity as to when the first arrival or by whom was and how that particular history works its way out. I don't want to go there. What I want to go to in the sense that we're going to deal in brief fashion with the situation in the United States and the nature of the construction known as the United States is that under the Constitution of the United States, first article right up front, 10th section, all entities other than the central government of the United States are precluded from entering into a treaty with anybody. States cannot do it lawfully in the United States. Counties cannot do it. Municipalities cannot do it. PTA groups cannot do it. Boy Scout troops cannot do it. You can't do it as an individual. Only the federal government of the United States is lawfully empowered to enter into a treaty relationship with any entity. And insofar as they cannot enter lawfully into a treaty relationship with those entities that are precluded, which is, say, states, counties, other subparts of itself, presumptively interpretation doctrine holds that it cannot enter into subparts of any other nation or anything less than a fully sovereign nation holding a legal standing, sovereign standing, equal to its own. So each time a treaty was ratified, in fact, I would argue each time a treaty was negotiated by the federal executive with an indigenous people, there's a conveyance of formal recognition by the federal government of the pre-existing sovereign status equal standing of the other party or parties to the treaty. There are 400 ratified treaties. There are approximately the same number, well, 401, according to DeLore and DeMalley, who have done the most careful compilation I'm aware of. They used to say 371. They came up with several others that had not been recorded in Kepler. So you got 400 odd times that the federal government of the United States executive negotiated treaties with indigenous peoples, and the Senate ratified those as the law of the land recognizing thereby the separate, distinct, sovereign existence of indigenous peoples as peers to the federal government to create a legal definition, a legal understanding that should be accepted by both sides. Indians always understood themselves. Indigenous peoples always understood themselves to be nations in their own right. The treaties do not make indigenous peoples nations. It simply conveys recognition of their pre-existing status as such. This does not go to the content of the treaties. You look at the treaties and often you're appalled at what the contents are. So we're talking about the nature 
of the implication of the existence of the treaties per se. There can be no question in American jurisprudence that these are other nations incorporated into the territorial landmass claimed by the United States. Now, it takes us to a different point of law. By the way, that element of the Constitution bears on international law because it has effect with regard to relations between the U.S. and other nations, meaning that U.S. relations with indigenous peoples, Seneca's for example, but any other treated indigenous people that you want to name, should be conducted by Department of State, not by Department of Interior. Diplomatic relations in terms of international affairs, not the domestic affairs of the United States. The reason that unless they agree to relinquish their rights as sovereigns, agree to relinquish their rights as sovereigns. They remain such. You understand how rights work? You have vestiture of rights. Let me take a really significant one that will resonate with virtually everyone in the room. It's going to be uncomfortable, but this is an uncomfortable topic. If you are on the side of those whose rights are being violated in the most intimate possible ways, everyone in this room has a right not to be raped. Anybody disagree with that? I don't see any disagreement. So the right stands. It's an inherent right. It's innate. It's a human right. We all understand that it exists, that it exists. Nonetheless, people are subjected to that. People are raped. Anybody disagree with that? So the right can be violated. Does the violation of the right remove the right? Do you lose the right by virtue of the violation? No, the right remains intact. The right remains intact even as the violation is occurring. The sovereign rights of indigenous peoples inside the United States are systematically, continuously violated by the United States insofar as they are denied the prerogative of exercising the sovereignty which has been recognized by formal treaty agreement time after time after time over a period of centuries. That right nonetheless remains intact unless and until someone can show me whether it's a voluntary relinquishment of that sovereign right by the indigenous people in question in any given instance. Unfortunately, you will find a few of those relinquishments now. But by and large, until very recently, it never occurred. And it wasn't all that recently that the United States asserted its territorial dominion from sea to shining sea, encompassing each and every one of the treaty peoples and the non-treaty peoples as well asserted its jurisdiction over their territories, imposed forms of government on them, and asserted a trust prerogative vis-a-vis -vis their assets, land, and the resources in the land, okay, thereby entitling itself in its own mind. Now, whether it actually believed this, created this rationale, that it was self-entitled to make this position of the resources. The resources which, as of the 1970s, added up to about a quarter of the known coal reserves in the United States, about 20% of the oil and natural gas, about two-thirds of the uranium, industrial-grade diamonds, I could keep on ticking it off. Okay, how does this work? Well in making that disposition of their assets through leasing arrangements, the colonizing power, because that's a term for this. When one country asserts itself, imposes itself upon another, whether it's for economic, strategic, that is to say military or political reasons or some combination, that's a colonial relationship. You have a colonizing power and you have colonized. Each of these subordinated, subjugated indigenous populations, peoples, nations inside the United States is a colonized people. Often not defined that way, although sometimes in a sort of flipped manner, the federal government itself has been wont to make reference to oh, energy colonies and so forth. 
Well, in assigning itself this trust authority to make disposition of resources through unilaterally extended lease arrangements, the federal government, working with preferred vendors, has extracted coal, has extracted the natural gas, has extracted the oil, has extracted the diamonds, has mined out the copper down in Oregon, up in Minnesota, has taken the iron ore, has leased out the grazing land, has diverted the water. In exchange, at least nominally, for royalties, although set at the lowest possible rates, far lower than market rates in virtually every case, placing the revenues deriving from the royalties in trust to the Bureau of Indian Affairs, which often we refer to as the Office of Colonial Affairs, okay? Leaving Indians, who on the basis of the quantity of resources extracted should be the wealthiest single population sector in North America, by every criteria, every indicator, the poorest single aggregate group. I spent the last 35 years of my life working by and large on and around the Pine Ridge Reservation, in and out. That's a western South Dakota, Shannon County on Pine Ridge. For 32 of those 35 years was the poorest single county in the continental United States. It's not now been displaced by a county of Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation, also in South Dakota. Okay, that's quantitatively the poorest. You're talking about people, when I started to work there, were trying to live through South Dakota winters. I don't know how many of you ever experienced them, but you've experienced <laughs> buffalo winters, so you've got some indication, absent perhaps the degree of wind force that there is on the open plains, 40 below and 40 mile an hour wind is not uncommon. Trying to live there for on 1,200 bucks a year per capita. It's not about 3,000. Okay, you got a vast gulf between the potential wealth on one hand and the practical poverty on the other. And Shannon County and the county on the Cheyenne River Reservation are indicative of the whole. The entire Northern Plains tier of reservations pretty much in that same condition. What accounts for it? Well, you can account for it in various ways. I mean, it starts to get kind of obvious since you've got this colonial ministry that's making disposition of the resources, setting the royalty rates, and holding the revenues in trust, holding the assets in trust. But you've got a recent case, a lawsuit that was taken to federal court, Cobell case. Anybody ever heard of it? Okay. Yeah, there's one. Don Grindy, I figured you probably heard it. Okay. This is a woman, a native woman from Montana, who figured out that people in her reservation had what in trust accounts should have been substantial amounts of money with which they could engage in, start up a small business enterprises, improve their properties, and so on. The only thing is they kept being told they were zero. So she finagled a lawsuit, Cool Bell versus, oh, I can't even remember who the Secretary of Interior was at the time she initially filed the suit. It went on for about 20 years. So the name of the case keeps changing as they change Secretaries of Interior. It's Cobell B, so-and-so, Cobell B, so-and-so, somebody else, Cobell B, God only knows who. Okay, I think probably started about the times of James Watt. It's all the same case, despite the difference in caption. What ultimately happens is that the Bureau of Indian Affairs admitted that they could not account for the monies that they were holding in trust for Indian property owners, and in some cases, whole peoples, for a period of about 110 years that they started not being able to account for the disposition of assets held in trust, liquid assets, back during the allotment period of the late 19th century. This really goes back to about 1890 and even in some cases a bit earlier. And that for that entire period of time, they often cannot account for what happened 
Money's not there anymore, but we don't know what happened to it. We don't know whether it was ever paid in. We don't know if it was spent, what it was spent on. We had a forensic audit that was done in that case that determined sometime in the early 2000s that there were as many as $170 billion worth of missing assets. Try to wrap your mind around that. Got the poorest people as a population aggregate in North America who had assets to the tune of $170 billion siphoned off into, well, what? One might suggest it was siphoned off into the quality of life that is enjoyed by the general population, which is to say what we call the settler population, the influx population that assumes, entitles itself to this territorial corpus, this jurisdiction, this entitles itself to quite a few things, but who subsidizes those things? Well, you could say that better bike pads and cappuccinos end up being subsidized by native children sitting in the cold at night, hungry, whimpering, and nobody has any ability to do anything about it. The government keeps talking about how much it's expended on Indians. Yeah, while well, drawing $170 billion off the top, they're throwing back a little bit of chump change, mostly in federally approved programs in order to convert Indians from being Indians as Indians understand Indians to be into something that white men would like them to be. And I cite white men in advisedly because predominantly over the years it's been white men who have administered to the programs, the duplicity, the deceptions, the whatever you want to call it. I'm not sure which word would best apply. All of the above and many more. That's the nature of a colonial relationship, but it's not really colonialism, I'll argue, because in order to be a colony properly understood, you must be separated from the colonizer by at least 30 miles of open blue seawater. Hmm. <laughs> Who came up with that one? Well, you go back into the UN minutes from the early 1960s of so the debates on the uh, declarations condemning colonialism as illegal and declaring the right to self-determination of all peoples, and you find hmm, the United States had something to say about that. Canada was pretty strong about that. <laughs> Australia and New Zealand were kind of strong about that. But even at that, you might ask the Hawaiians, since the last I heard, they were kind of separated by more than 30 miles of open blue water from the United States, whether even that criteria has any bearing. You can find the Kanaka Maui, who are the indigenous Hawaiians, living on the park benches and picnic tables at the beaches when they're not busily being evicted to make room for golf courses. Yeah, in the alley population, sitting there complaining about how much of a burden on the public treasury these native people, lazy folk that they are, might be, as they wallow around in relative luxury in somebody else's territory. Well, the wallowing around in relative luxury, luxury is a relative thing. And for most of us in the room, we live in luxury as compared to a per capita income of $1,200 a year in rural South Dakota. We are all part of the 99%, right? But some of us are a little more part of the uh, oppressed than that slogan would apply, don't you think? Oh, I know. I'm being divisive. <laughs> yeah, I'm being divisive. <laughs> The guy living under the bridge in Atlanta is in the same bag as me. Well, actually, no, he's not, and he's the priority. I'm not. Mm -hmm. And we need to come up with a system of priorities, which begins with the most depressed and alleviating their circumstances, and deal with the guy who's making 350 grand a year working in brokerage, although he is in the 99th percentile, so he's part of the 99 percent. We deal with that a little further down the line, maybe. Maybe. Don't you think? Shame on me for being so busy. <laughs> Just a humble suggestion. See, I've heard a lot of slogans over the years when I talk about things like this. We are opposed to the hierarchy. The hierarchy. Which hierarchy? The hierarchy. 
And oh, by the way, there is no hierarchy to oppression. Anybody that hasn't heard one of the other or both of those? Yeah. You have. Well, first of all, I think I know what you mean by the hierarchy. That's a particular hierarchy. You might stop talking about hierarchy in a vacuous sense because hierarchy is kind of a natural thing. Natural order functions for interactive hierarchies often. Nothing inherently wrong with the hierarchy. That particular hierarchy, I might tend to agree with you, except I can't reconcile that to the notion that there is no hierarchy to oppression. If that oppressive hierarchy that we're opposing is indeed a hierarchy, then it's oppression that it dispenses might be hierarchical as well, don't you think? To say there is no hierarchy to oppression is to say that it, uh, oh, butt pinched at the water cooler, which is in fact the oppression. And I'm not going to argue that it's not. But I'm not going to equate it to being a receiving end of a program of genocide, which is also oppression. But I say, rather substantive, more substantial scale. To be colonized is a particularly virulent form of oppression. And to be colonized is also to be subject to genocide. And you can turn to Sartre, if you don't want to take my word for it, 1968 on genocide. You cannot impose and maintain a colonial system without having a genocidal impact upon the colonized period. Colonization thus equals genocide. Genocide does not always equal colonization. You don't have to colonize people to subject them to genocide, but if you do colonize them, you will have a genocidal impact. So, what I'm suggesting is another form of hierarchy, which is called the system of priorities. I've already tipped my hand and suggested that we do it on the basis of relative degrees of oppression. The most oppressed are the highest priority and vice versa. We have limited energy available to us, limited resources available to us. We might want to focus and concentrate on some particularly acute points. Indigenous people and their rights and the nature of colonization, internal colonization within the United States offer a particularly important potential for liberation much more broadly than themselves in struggling to assert indigenous rights on the basis of law, on the basis of common morality, on the basis of philosophical efficacy, on the basis of what pick one or combine them all, I don't care which. Just on a basic sense of right and wrong. You have to understand that each itch of territory returned to functioning indigenous sovereign control is an inch withdrawn from the territorial corpus of the United States. And it is on the basis of the cohesion of that internal colonial construction the United States creates for itself a platform to project itself outward in this form of new colonialism they call globalization and blah blah blah. It exists, but it cannot exist absent the maintenance of a colonial imperial system here. Colonialism and imperialism are interactive. You can't have colonialism without a functioning imperial system, but you cannot have an actual imperial system but it does not require direct occupation and so forth. Absent colonies, in some respects, somewhere. And here, it's in a major sense. We're looking at roughly a third of the territorial corpus of the 48 contiguous states to which the United States cannot point to a document, a shred, meaning no treaty, no agreement, not even a unilateral act of taking by the Congress of the United States which would be invalid anyway, but it doesn't exist. They simply came in and took the land, asserted control, and it benefited themselves and the general populace, which would then applaud. That was the expectation, and the expectation has been rewarded with applause throughout the last 200 plus years of the existence of this thing called the United States. Now we could get into why this acquisition of indigenous land 
was a primary motivator of the so-called American Revolution, which was actually a decolonization struggle of war for independence. But we'll leave that in time. The relationship between the new imperialism out there in the world, what the United States is doing in the Horn of Africa, in the Middle East, what the United States is doing in South Asia and elsewhere, is absolutely contingent upon the maintenance of the colonial construction right here. Right here is where we could actually do something. Rather than protesting what they're doing out here, we go to work on undoing the colonial construction at home. That's a long way from the prevailing consciousness in what I see as self-styled progressive circles. And progressive, actually, we could talk about that at some point, too. Perhaps radical would be a better word. Radical means to go to the root. The, in the United States, as to the existence of the United States, we have arrived at the root, the very foundation of the problem from which all the others ensue. We got all of these things that we're against. We got militarism, we got ageism, we got sexism, we got, well, you know the isms as well as I do. We can run off the screen. So let's take a flight of fantasy, if you will, and let's say we suddenly cohered and mounted a movement collectively from all sides, and we abolished sexism, we abolished ageism, we abolished racism. We abolished all the other isms to which we are opposed without changing the nature of property relations, if you will, <laughs> having to do with a colonized piece of the settler population in North America. Every single one of the things that we had just defeated would reconstitute itself because we would still be a fundamentally colonizing and imperialist society. That would be the result. Because all of those other things were made possible on the basis of that initial colonial impulse. And it has never gone away. It is simply now denied, driven at subliminal level and so forth. There's a priority. Try it this way. First people's first priority. Ooh. Ooh. Balloons got punctured. Not necessarily in this room, although if your balloon got punctured, you know you're among the many balloons that are punctured and the signals start popping like flares in certain quarters in Washington, D.C. I started out as an activist coming out of Vietnam. See, VVAW captain I'm still wearing, I'm a life member of that been a Vietnam veteran against the war ever since I became a veteran of Vietnam. But I really started out in the Rainbow Coalition, the original Rainbow Coalition that was established by Fred Hampton and Jose Manis in Chicago back in 19... Well, they got it going a little bit in 1968. I didn't show up on the scene until 69 when I got back to Vietnam. This is the Rainbow Coalition that Jesse Jackson later converted into something almost entirely the opposite of itself. But I was only around 69 and 70. So, one of the things that resulted from that was, since I was from downstate Illinois, and got designated as a organizer for downstate, I ended up working with a guy by the name of Mark Clark. Mark Clark, for those of you who don't know, was the other panther killed in the arms raid in Fred Hampton's apartment on the 4th of December 1969. I got up close and personal after Vietnam with the fact that they were conducting a counterinsurgency campaign in the United States against revolutionary organizations. That is, say, organizations that wanted to affect fundamental change to the nature of relations in this society. But that was only the beginning. <laughs> in 75, I'd already been recruited into the American Indian Movement. In 75, I relocated into South Dakota, and I got a good look at the actual. No holes barred, we're out of sight, out of mind in the general population, unlike in Chicago, where we had to manipulate the information in order to 
uh, thing, public support, part of the necessary is public support, not have police and FBI personnel charged with, oh, I don't know, first degree murder for things like the Hampton and the Clark assassinations. <coughs> out in the Wild West, in the rural Hampton land, they could just do it right flat out and open. They're running death squads on Pine Ridge, old goons. Goons, contrary to myth, weren't all Indians either. Although there were people working for tribal government, you had goons, goon squads. That was their name for themselves after a while. It wasn't an after that was being thrown at them. They were the functioning death squad. They had white vigilante groups working there too. Rate of death in Pine Ridge when I got there was virtually interchangeable with the rate of death in Chile after Pinochet's coup. 73 through 76 on Pine Ridge and 73 through 76 on Pine Ridge. Uh, in Pine Ridge and in Chile, virtually identical. I was talking about this earlier today in an interview. I don't remember what the rate for 100,000 for violent deaths in Detroit was during those years, but by the Uniform Crime Report of the FBI, Detroit was a so-called murder capital of the country. And whatever the rate for 100,000 was, Pine Ridge was running nine times that level. I never got a mention. These were just political deaths. These were named members and named supporters. And not a single federally, federally, uh, let me put it another way. Not a single prosecution brought, brought by a Federal Bureau of Investigation for any of those murders, although the FBI holds preeminent jurisdiction on FBI, on, on um, Indian reservations nationwide. Okay? What was the big deal in Pine Ridge? Well, it's this issue of indigenous sovereignty. It's this issue of the right of indigenous peoples to define for themselves the nature of their political relations with other countries and other peoples. The right to exercise jurisdiction and authority over their land, they make disposition of their resources and so forth. That was the aim agenda and that was supported by the traditional population on the reservation at the time. And that was the reason for the intensity of the campaign of repression. It was quantitatively more intensive than what I experienced kind of secondhand with regard to the repression of the Black Panther Party. And that was a vicious, bloody affair. And I'm still visiting people in prison as a result of that. Okay? Probably will be until I die or they die. Because they're not letting them out. You know, you need to contrast that to uh, Ronald Reagan's little speech. It was made in 1980 when you had three FBI officials finally convicted of criminal actions as a result of their conduct during the Cointel probe. Three, COINTEL Pro being the counterintelligence operations, as they called them, that were direct political repression purposes. You had three FBI officials convicted of violation of rights, and he commuted their sentences before they even had a chance to appeal their convictions. They never spent a minute in jail. And what he said was, this points back to a, a troubled and turbulent time, I'm paraphrasing, but closely, troubled and turbulent time in our history and we need to look forward rather than dwell on the past. And so the three FBI guys skated. They were the only people ever prosecuted as a result of what was done to the Panthers and to the Young Lords and to the American Indian Movement and so forth. Meanwhile, the people who were the victims of framing up, like Geronimo Pratt, I'll speak to his case in a second, like Leonard Peltier, like any of a number of others I can mention, remained in their cells. Now, Pratt did get out. Pratt was the head of the LA Panthers after his predecessor was assassinated on the UCLA campus in 1969. Bunchy Carter, who was head of that particular chapter, had left a tape recording and said in the event, something happens to me, G should take over. And they immediately took him as a target. This is a highly decorated veteran two tours combat in Vietnam. This is how they treat combat vets. For any of you out there that is going to have to talk to young people about whether or not they should go in the military, this is how they treat somebody with 11 
decorations for valor and combat from the 82nd Airborne Division, two tours back to back in Vietnam. Okay, they framed him for what was called tennis court murder. Captain in Santa Monica, California, on day one, to the FBI's knowledge, he was attending the Central Committee meeting of the Black Panther Party in Oakland, California. I say to their knowledge because the meeting was bugged. The phones up there were bugged. They had electronic surveillance. They could place them there. They knew it. They denied it. They had electronic surveillance. He was sentenced to life in prison for 27 years before <coughs> finally got out. Got out because a key witness against him had been a police informant, infiltrator, provocateur. All right, and had denied it on the stand on the basis of that perjury the jury convicted. This was proven that Julio Butler was in fact an FBI operative. And a right-wing Republican judge in Orange County cut him loose. So don't count on necessarily conservatives being inherently your enemy or immune to appeals to common decency. Richard Nixon was the last, in concert with Barry Goldwater, some of you may remember that name, was the last person to actually provide substantive land return to an indigenous people in North America, Taos Blue Lake. Nixon did more in terms of restoring wrongly taken land to indigenous people than all the Democratic presidents in the entire 20th century. Oh, yeah. On the other hand, Barack Obama, change we can't believe in, <laughs> said with regard to people known to have engaged in the torture of prisoners versus uh, torture of prisoners for extraction of information, CIA torturers, independent contractor torturers, other torturers working on behalf of the United States government. Well, we need to look forward rather than to the past. And therefore, we're not going to prosecute the torturers, even when the evidence is available. Sound just like Ronald Reagan to me. Yeah. Only now we're talking about out there, just like Reagan was talking about in here, the relationship between what the United States does out there in the world and what the United States does domestically when it meets resistance. Pretty much the same. John Yu, who wrote fraudulent memoranda in concert with David Addington and several others to create a legal pretext for this. Whole Association of American International Jurisprudence voted that he should not only be removed from his academic position but prosecuted for war crimes as a result of that. He's still in his position as a full professor of law, full fall. <clears throat> no prosecution there, not even a reprimand, and so on, and so on, and so on. The Republican, Republicrat, actually the Republicrat is sometimes preferable to the Demopublican because the general expectation is that the Democrat, because the rhetoric is different, will somehow be more progressive and sensitive and adherent to law. than the Republican counterpart. Often that's true, but then again, often it's not. They're interchangeable, the agenda is the same, the style can be a bit different. Barack Obama, well, null crossing actual war crimes defenders, torturers, violators of human life rights, hasn't prosecuted them, but he has prosecuted two people who leaked information about the torture. Barack Obama has prosecuted more leakers in the course of his, how many years now? Five? Than all of the other presidents since the law was affected generations ago. Barack Obama, the liberal alternative, is to the right, objectively, demonstrably, 
to Richard Nixon, who was a right-wing boogeyman in my day. This is Nixon of the anti-communist, his case. This is Nixon who's going to bomb Cambodia. Nixon who, yeah, he did all that. And he also pursued universal health care, and he affected environmental protections, and so on and so on and so on, that on its face was an agenda far more progressive than anything Barack Obama has produced thus far. Obama is far more oppressive than the repressive Richard Nixon. Presides over an apparatus of repression much more successful. Much more seamless. Much more deadly. And I mean deadly in a literal sense, yeah. They have, uh, I understand, drones now the size of hummingbirds. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, soon to be over, But they got the other drones too. And they want to talk about it and rationalize everything in terms of terrorism. Terrorism here, terrorism there, terrorism everywhere. The United States is required to fight a global war on terrorism. Uh, excuse me. You look up and see the drone. Which one of you in here can distinguish between a reconnaissance drone? It's assuming it's not the size of a hummingbird and you can actually see it when it's more than 100 feet off the ground. But you see the drone up there, which is the reconnaissance drone and which is the predator's drone? Which one is going to zap you with no warning at all, based upon a signature that's applied in secret for the President of the United States? It can't, by the way, he claims the right to apply it to U.S. citizens for surgical removal. I don't know. I kind of know what it's like to get targeted because of things you say that are offensive to the powers that be. But for all the targeting that I experienced, I'm not Anwar al -Aki. They did not target me with a Predator drone three times until they finally managed to kill me and then for good measure run another drone strike two weeks later and killed my also U.S. citizen son. Sixteen years old, wasn't active in anything yet, simply had gone south into Yemen to try to find his father. They found out he was there, got the location, and whacked him too. Why? Well, there were good reasons. You can't know what they were. Someone would have to leak them, then join Bradley Manning, waiting for a life sentence under the Espionage Act. And this is your progressive alternative <laughs> to George Bush. Hey, I'm no fan of George Bush. You can trust me on that. But as compared to Barack Obama, Bush is relatively benign. He was clumsy as hell. Okay. Bush uses maneuver battalions and main force to make a really big show because that's the neocon ethos. We're going to be the bully boy on the block and belligerent as hell. We're going to show those wogs that we can crush them frontal assault rather than surgically the way Obama's doing it. Yeah. But hey, you run the body count for the Bush war in Iraq and it comes out somewhat the same as was done through sanctions under another liberal alternative named Bill Clinton. Wasn't there something about 542,000 unnecessary deaths of Iraqi children under the age of 12 as a result of sanctions? which prevented the repair of things like sanitary facilities, production of infant formula, denial of critical medications and so forth. And oh yeah, that was the radical Lancet in Great Britain and arrived at that extrapolation that the right wing keeps trying to repudiate. Noam Chomsky says there's a half million. By God, there were only 300,000. <laughs> well, let me take you 300,000. You think that's the only situation and you value brown-skinned children about like you value toilet paper, and I draw certain implications from that. That's the best argument you got, but the number was a little too high. Aside from which, what are you putting up against the Lancet to come up with a lower number? I don't know. But when you look at a country of 20 million odd people, a half million children under 12, you're talking about the entire next generation. And that's only the ones that are dead. That's not talking about the ones that suffered permanent damage as a result of untreated disease, malnutrition, and so on. You essentially committed genocide there without waging a war. The casualty rate went down during the active combat. So everyone runs out to protest the war. I don't remember the protests while the sanctions were being imposed. 
by Bill Clinton. Do you? Anybody remember the mass protests? No. Yeah, we went to WTO in Seattle. Yeah, and was that what was being protested at WTO? Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Score one. <laughs> a portion of the uprising in Seattle, which I grew up very much, was devoted to acknowledging the fact that there were a whole lot of dead Iraqi children. Okay? And there were going to be more, and Madeleine Albright had gone on nationwide TV to make sure that everybody was aware of it, and which we consider it worth the price, worth the price of somebody else's children. Okay. That sounds kind of like the little kids sitting in the cold suffering malnutrition and shivering in the dark on an Indian reservation the way the young people of another brown-skinned country are valued by the general population of the United States because whatever else can be said about Seattle, it wasn't the general population that was coming out. It was a relatively select number of people. And the people who actually put Seattle in a class by itself where it actually had some consequence were broadly condemned by the more responsible movement types like Medea Benjamin running around waving her pledge of nonviolence. Here, disempower yourself before you go. Be nonviolent as you want, but don't announce the fact beforehand to people who are not going to be nonviolent and thus disempower yourself, relatively speaking, in the face of that. Gee. <laughs> and do not go into a free peace free speech pin. I can barely get that term out. You know, the free speech areas, they set outside with picket fences out of, safely out of sight, in mind of the people you're supposed to be influencing through your protests, like, into which the opposition herds itself like self-herding sheep. <laughs> talk to each other and then run home to watch the six o'clock news to see how the words resonate. But, Hopefully the politicians you're supposed to influence are watching the same newscast as you because that's the only way they know you'd say anything at all. Don't need the police to put people into the pins. Okay, the police will help define where the pins are going to be, but we got movement marshals and responsible types to make sure that order is maintained, nothing is disrupted, and this is going to destabilize the status quo and affect fundamental change. Give me a break. <laughs> I want to be understood here. I am not opposed to masturbation. <laughs> it serves useful purposes. I even have some experience in that regard. All right, I'm not going to disavow it, but I think it's something best done in private, not paraded in public as politics. And it's circling the same old rock of ineffectuality, pretending to be virtuous as a result of having engaged in a ritual charade, constitutes political masturbation. It has not changed a goddamn thing in the history of the United States to date, and it will not ever. It is sanctioned by the state, and anything the state sanctions is guaranteed to be non-disruptive to the state. If you want to work with the state, you honest enough to say so or stay home. Yeah. I am not nonviolent. I am not a pacifist. Nor am I making a virtue of picking up a gun. I've been active for 40 years, one way or another, and fully engaged most of that period of time. And in that period, upwards of 95% of all the activities that I've engaged in would be qualified as nonviolent. And I say that in refusing to pledge to be nonviolent in the face of an armed opponent. that's a predominating form. And it's a reaction to things that happened in the 60s. See, what happened coming out of the 60s is you actually had a destabilization of the status quo beginning to occur. Not solely as a result of the forms of struggle and opposition that were in the streets, but because of a lack of confidence that was beginning to take hold in the quarters of the establishment. And that got scary. I mean, they were thrashing about the people who they considered most effective and likely to further destabilize the situation were getting killed and were getting sent to prison, and a whole lot of people ran for cover and then invented ever more elaborate rationales to explain why they were the only revolutionaries and those who had been pursuing active revolutionary and drawing the repression of the state were somehow or another counter-revolutionary and 
effectual sense. Up to the point where you got Homi Baba running around talking about any form of physical resistance to colonialism, for example, is objectively counter-revolutionary. Franz Fanon's thought was counter-revolutionary, okay? Cabral was counter-revolutionary. Everybody was counter-revolutionary. In fact, the only revolutionary activity is to read more and more books and write ever more dense prose explaining what it was you just read so other people can be as absolutely caught up in mental masturbation as you. <laughs> yeah. That's been the whole trajectory since the so-called turn, to, turn to theory, which occurred circa 1965. When I say Cabral, does anybody know who I mean? Amalad? 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 Cabral, head of the Guinean Re Revolution, decolonization from Portugal. All right, well, let me try again. If I say the name Foucault, how many people will recognize that? I'll rest my case. If I say Baudrillard, probably less than Foucault, but more than Cabral. We've got unity and struggle on them. Huh? We've got unity and struggle by Cabral on For those of you Okay. <laughs> yeah, the information, it's hard to get, but it's still, and if you've got it in print, it's much easier to get now than it was two years ago. Yeah, the actual revolutionaries have been submerged. They got to look to AK Press, PM, and these little presses that are recycling stuff. It's not coming out of the. It's not coming out, shall we say, of Verso. It's not coming out of Routledge. Theory, 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 theory. Theory serves a purpose, but theory is not in itself effectuating any kind of fundamental change. And the argument, the impetus to the opposite is what I was referring to as sort of the pathology of pacifism. Pacifism can be a, a really potent recipe for change in certain contexts. It can even be the predominating one. But actually read Gandhi. How many pacifists we got in here? It's okay, I won't, I won't attack you. <laughs> really. No pacifists in the entire room. I find that hard to believe. Oh well. I've been in academia long enough that disingenuousness and denial are old hats. So okay. A third of you probably see yourselves as being pacifists by some denomination or another, some definition or another. And generally speaking, would perhaps through Martin Luther King lay claim to the Gandhian legacy. It's kind of hard to do this one now since we've got nobody to admit to it. <laughs> but if I one brave enough person here to acknowledge being a pacifist, okay, okay, two more. Now we got, you see, so trend, there's another, we got four. Okay, I got four of you identified. I guess I'll have to serve as a sample group. How many of you are proficient weapons? One? Wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. You didn't identify as being pacifist. No, I, I misunderstood. If you're a gunslinger, of course you are. Pacifist, pacifist only. This is an exclusive process here. So, out of the four self identified pacifists in the room, how many of you? Feel that you are proficient with firearms. Well, I've only shot one a few times. I was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty good. A few times I shot. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's some degree of proficiency. So <laughs> you're not. You? I'm pretty good with an M16A1 rifle. Oh. <laughs> oh. Chris. <laughs> there, there, there's a smell of proficiency in the area. <laughs> At least possible proficiency. We can, we can test you on this. Back there. Three or four? You are proficient. I live out in the country. I was a target shooter with a 22 scope. Okay, you're qualified. Also, I was in the security police in the <laughs> so you'll have to shoot yourself in the leg trying to holster your weapon. Okay. <laughs> Police. Mm -hmm. 
Well, that's just rather astonishing. I think we have a skewed sample, but nonetheless, it is decent. <laughs> and therefore, it's a good academic. I'll work from the sample. Three quarters of the self-identified pacifists in the room are qualified in Gandhian terms to play the mantle of pacifists. Sorry. <laughs> Gandhi quite logically said, in order to be a conscious pacifist, you need to be proficient in firearms so that you can make a choice as to whether or not to use them. If you are not proficient, you've got no choice. All you are is disempowered. There's no virtue in weakness, moral or otherwise. So you learn what it is that you would have the option of using and decline the option to be a practicing pacifist. And perchance you think you're a pacifist and it turns out when they come to take you away that you're not. It's a little late to learn and go shopping for a weapon, so you need it. Mm -hmm. Wait, 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 wait. I need to run down to, what's the gun store in this town? Buffalo Gun Club. Yeah, I need to run down to Buffalo Gun Club and, and, and pick up, you know, 400 rounds of ammunition and something that will penetrate your Kevlar. Just hold it right there until I get back, okay? Oh, I need a couple lessons while I'm there. Which end the bullet comes out? Yeah. Yeah, see Gandhi wasn't all on about this disempowerment business. In fact, Gandhi violated all kinds of Gandhian principles and ultimately said, you know, although I actually believe in this and believe it's a true way, there is this dimension of what I'm about which has to do with winning this struggle for Indian independence. And I feel this is the best way to go at it, but I'm human, subject to error, I might be wrong, and if I am, count me in with the seats. Okay, so we can't do it this way, we're gonna do it the other way, but it is gonna get done. That's kind of king. Although he wasn't right out front saying it, he was right out front in practice. A couple of those long marches there were to his knowledge, secured by the deacons for self-defense and justice, and this was an armed group. Okay, King got much more effective and acceptable to the status quo once Stokely Carmichael and Rep Brown came out with black power and repudiated nonviolence. That you shoot at us, we will shoot back. Stokely punctuated that in Anderson County, Alabama with the original Black Panther Party, Bobby Seale and Huey Newton asked for and received permission to use that symbol and that name to start the Oakland organization. It was a different thing. But they did it so they could register voters in Alabama in the face of endemic clan violence. And guess what? Clan ain't real bright. When black folk picked up the gun, clan violence dropped off, which is say violence abated. So being armed actually had the effect of alleviating social violence. It is not so simple as signing a pledge of nonviolence. It is adapting tactics that in a particular context will prove effective, and that is what you need to be on about. Not false principles. There's no particular virtue in being nonviolent. There is no particular virtue in picking up a gun. There is a virtue in winning. What can we do? We can think about that. What can we do? We can support a system of priorities that begin with first peoples as first priority, which could solve a lot of problems in this particular area. Environmentally, economically, socially, and otherwise. But it takes a clarity of consciousness and an understanding of history to allow that to happen. And it also takes concrete actualization. Not just talking the talk, but walking the walk in a lot of cases. People will respond to an example. People will respond to a victory no matter how small. Pick targets that you can actually win with in this area. I won't tell you what those targets should be. I'm not in a position to do so. You are. You are. Discuss it. Work between communities. Use that principle of most oppressed as first priority. What can we do in this context to accomplish concrete result? Accomplish that result. Choose something doable. Accomplish it. You work out from there. You build strength and empowerment in that fashion. It's not an event. It's a process. 
It's a process born of certain consciousness. In the alternative, enjoying the way things are going right now? Yeah? Expect a whole lot more of absent some sort of effectual response. And I suggest that each person in this room, irrespective of particularities of your experience, owe it to yourselves as a human being to strive for something better. You owe it to yourselves. You surely owe it to your children. You owe it to your grandchildren. I know I owe it to mine. I owe it to her children and her children's children. I owe it seven generations out into the future. I have not just a right, but an obligation to engage in struggle, to bequeath to those coming generations better than what it is that I've encountered in my life and what you've encountered in yours. I think that's something that we could arrive at a common agreement with and on. So. And with that said, I've talked longer than I intended to. Got to leave some time for mud wrestling. So I think I'm going <laughs> to stand down, otherwise known as shut up. Thank you for listening. Matako Asa. going to suggest that we take 10 between this point and the next point so people can step outside if you want to because it's a little warm in the room now. People can use the necessary room if you need to, stretch your legs and like me, get a cigarette. The elite will meet on the street for a smoke. <laughs> then we will reconvene here, those who want to. Refresh, recharge, and do battle.